in our sport, it those one percents matter. So we are we're trying to create this environment. I, we've talked about this on the podcast, but we believe that environment trumps all. You can gauge somebody's success, like society success, you know, in terms of um, monetary earning value. You can gauge someone's success better by the zip code that they grew up in than their IQ level. Like your environment matters more than your talent at that level. And that goes for everything. So what we're trying to do is create the very, very best training environment for these athletes. So super cool things. The first thing you got to do is you want to create a revolution is get a bunch of revolutionaries in the same room. We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to live on the run. Always chasing, never stop. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Chasing Excellence. I think... This is episode 167 or 168. That's how many episodes we've done, Ben. That's a lot. Cool. I, yeah, that's... that's I mean, it's not lot. Joe Rogan. When did Joe we start? What, like year did, what year did we start? Uh, late 2015. Yeah. But, oh, wow. So we've been doing this for go, going into our this going into our sixth yeah. year. Is that math right? So, yeah, so depending on the wow. exactly when we started. But yeah, I was thinking right. that since we started, I've had two children, which is insane <laughs> to me. <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> That's amazing. You become a dad, yeah, dad twice. Right. All right, my man. I'm excited for this conversation. We've hinted Who at it. Who knew when you when when you started like when you had, when you came to my office one day you're like I think we should do a podcast. I was like I've never listened to one, but okay. Honestly, like, at that time there weren't that many. Like I I mean there were there were right. uh, certainly plenty, but there weren't that many that were that were uh, had a good size. Like Tim Ferriss had just kind of started his and he was really one of the, you know, Joe Rogan had started his as well, but there weren't a lot like it certainly doesn't look like it does. It didn't right. look like it does now for sure. All right. So we're going to talk about today. I'm excited about this. We've hinted at it. We've teased it. Um, you've talked about it a little bit just through comp train. I know that there was an article on morning chalk up that, that talked about it a little bit, but it's this idea of the comp train Academy, right? And um, mm -hmm. I'm going to let you kind of do the announcement. It's not even announcements because it'll be, it'll be out before this podcast is, but Amanda Barnhart has moved up to the Boston area to train with you, to train with Katrin. Um, uh, and so lots of the, you know, there's a lot going on there at the gym. So I wanted to, I've been looking forward to this, um, conversation about just like, what is happening there? What are the plans? What are the, you know, where is this all coming from? And let's start with, uh, like I said, the announcement will already have been made, but this will, the, this is the first time we've talked, talk to me about the new athlete who you guys have moving up there, coming in to train on a regular basis there at CFNE. So we now have, uh, we're going to have five athletes on the comp train elite team. Um, that is what, who most people know, Katrin, David Sauter, and Cole Sager. Um, they've been the, the most grandfathered of our athletes. i um, been working with both those athletes for five, six, seven years. Um, for the last few years, been working with Amanda Barnhart. She moved to Boston um, the beginning of this year. Sam Quant, who came in second at the games. Uh, also moved to Boston the beginning of this year to train with us. And um, Chandler Smith mm. is the new one. Love so Chandler, um, we love Chandler, Has uh, is moving here. He's here now with us right now. He's been working with us for about a week. Um, he's also living in Boston. So uh, we, we've developed, yeah, we are a, it's an individual sport. Like everyone competes individually. We're trying to do something different. And we're trying to, I believe that there's uh, there's advantages both competitively, performance-wise, but also life-wise. Yeah. And everyone that listens to this podcast knows kind of the ultimate metrics of success that we measure things on. And I think that there's a, there's a huge advantage to having a team, having a crew, having a tribe, having a, a, a group of people that you can uh, lean on and trust on. And um, that's, uh, that's kind of the, the start of this whole thing is if we were to think about um, you know, you kind of, you said it, we're creating a, an academy. And if you think about it, the way that everyone's trained for the sport and us included for sure, for the last two, three, five, ten 10 years, I, I think it's all been done at a amateur level. 
I, I just, I, I, that's, I don't know how else to say it. It's like you have these sort of part-time coaches because they all have other jobs working with athletes on a part-time basis. And the athletes are sort of doing this even at the highest level. I don't want to say at a part-time, but not, not the way they would if it was some other sports, right? If, if we were going to get gold medals in basketball, it would not look like it does. You'd have more resources. You've had better facilities. You'd have more coaches. And I literally mean not only just better, but more. One, it wouldn't be one coach. You'd have an assistant coach. You'd have a nutritionist. You'd have a bodywork coach. You'd have um, a sports psychologist. You'd have a team built around you. You'd have agents and managers. You'd have people trying to take some things off of the stress level of the athletes and trying to optimize them. So when we think about how do we optimize an athlete, if you take away the sacred cows and take away the legacy and the way it's done in the past, you start from a blank slate, you go, how would we do this? And what I would do is I would get some really cool, really good athletes that I think would draw, like jive together and create a really cool vibe that there wouldn't be drama or gossip or hating on each other because somebody beat somebody, but instead create the right type of, of competitive mm-hmm. cauldron. The time where they are pushing each other in all the best ways because they're also supporting each other in all the best ways. And then from there, you build out the infrastructure both the facility, the coaching team, the resources that would be available to those athletes to make sure that they are maximizing their minutes. Because at this level, like going into the pain cave is the price of admission. Like everyone's doing that. So everyone's working really hard. Everyone's doing thrusters, pull-ups, running, rowing. Everyone's even working on their weaknesses. Everybody is eating well. Like at that level, everyone's doing this stuff. In our sport, arguably better than most sports because – it's kind of it's it's truly just about the work capacity. Um, if you have a good three point shot in our sport, it doesn't matter. Like you can get by with that in other sports. If you have a rocket of an arm, you can maybe make it as a quarterback in a Division One school, even if you're not totally committed to the process. In our sport, it those one percents matter. So we are we're trying to create this environment. I, we've talked about this on the podcast, but we believe that environment trumps all. You can gauge somebody's success like society success, you know, in terms of um, monetary earning value, you can gauge someone's success better by the zip code that they grew up in than their IQ level. Like your environment matters more than your talent at that level. And that goes for everything. So what we're trying to do is create the very, very best training environment for these athletes. So super cool things. The first thing you got to do is you want to create a revolution is get a bunch of revolutionaries in the same room. So that's goal. That's like number one was we invited these athletes to come out here. I had a four year vision, which each year was going to track up to another level of this thing. Um, thinking that maybe we'd get one athlete this year. And huh, uh, we, I guess we are, we were better salesmen than we gave ourselves credit for. Cause everybody said yes. Like everyone said yes. Um, the only one that's not here is Cole. And that's because Cole had a, had a baby. Um, early. <laughs> like he had a, the baby's doing yeah. great. His name's baby Jack. Um, he's doing phenomenal, but, um, Cole and Genesee, we love them. They wanted to be here. Um, but, uh, had a baby and the baby was born at one pound, 10 ounces. Um, extremely early. The baby's now four pounds and doing really well, hoping to be discharged in the next three to six weeks. So pumped about that. But the cool thing is every single athlete said, yes, that's also kind of the crappy thing because we had to build this thing yeah. really fast. We were not expecting yeah. this. Um, honestly, we were expecting the only person we were actually knew was going to move here was Chandler. Mm, that's fine. Um, which is the one we haven't announced. And everyone else we were working with before, we just thought that they were so entrenched in what they were doing. But yeah, they were psyched. They were um, really excited to be a part of this thing. So we invited them out here. Uh, and we have a, a, a bunch of different things that we're trying to trying to do. Some of the things we've talked about. We have like they're getting professional body work done. We're working with sports psychologists. We are building a new facility for them that's exclusive to Comp Train athletes and the Comp Train Academy, separate from CrossFit New England. Um, the academy will be uh, three tiered. So we're not there right now, but in the four year vision, in four years we'll have three different. Tiers. One is the elites, and the elites are our brand ambassadors and the people that are um, trying to crack the top 10 in the podium at the games. And luckily, I mean, we had two people finished on the podium last year, which is phenomenal. Um, 
all those athletes fit that mold. Like Amanda, Chandler, Cole, Sam, Katrin, they're all like perennial top tens. Um, the next thing we have is what we call our dev team. And that's a developmental team. And this is for athletes and age matters in our mm-hmm. sport. We got to like, like embrace the harsh realities. And it's, it's crazy that people aren't like, no, if um, athletes that are in that 18 to 22 year old, uh, 22 year old that are looking to become one of these athletes, um, these athletes um, train in the facility. We, um, we only have one of these athletes right now. Um, her name is Emma Gardner. She was a, um, a teen athlete last year and she's uh, 18 now. So she's now in our developmental program. So we have these three tiers, the elites, the ones that are cracking the top 10 of the games, our dev team, which will be people that are on the fringe of making the games, but really we want to do this the right way and not have them try to make it every year, but grow them the yeah. right way. And the way you grow them is not the way you set someone up to compete. And then underneath that dev team, we will have a truly uh, like a youth academy. Mm-hmm. And just like every other, think of every other individual Olympic sport, I don't want to say every other, but most others, right? Whether it's wrestling or gymnastics or swimming, skiing, you go to the U.S. ski team and train with them in Vail. You go to um, uh, the USA Gymnastics Training Center and you train with them. You go to um, Michael Johnson's performance to train if you're on the track team. And you train together in a group. So there's precedent for this, which is you need to be able to do this because otherwise you can't assemble the, the resources, None of these individuals can afford to do this if it's a one-off. You can't have an endurance coach and a sports psychologist and a nutrition and a body work person. But when you get an academy around these people, then the economics start to make sense. So what we'll do is have uh, a youth development program underneath all of that, which is for high school age kids. And in the f- in near future, you can envision people – picking up their kids and moving across the country to move to Natick, Massachusetts to send their kids to a school here. And the kids will train before and after school at our academy. That's also lines up well because it's not in line with when the elites and the dev team will be here. They'll be here during school hours. Um, Those before and after school sessions um, will be very structured incredibly differently than the other athletes because this is truly the long road. We're going with a 10-year vision and us trying to maximize your Fran time right now is not going to be right. helpful. What we need to do is get people 25 plus unbroken muscle ups, be able to run sub six minute miles and be able to um, clean and jerk um, 350 for a guy and 250 for a girl. Now we have at 18, 19, when you have those numbers, now we have the makings to work on the finer points of what competition looks mm-hmm. like and what the third wave adaptation looks like for our sport. Um, Other kind of cool things is this can work now because honestly, because of Eric Mm. Rosa, (laughs) like honestly, that's what, like when Eric Rosa came in to, um, this has been in the back of my mind forever. Like I've always had this kind of like, what if we could do this? What if we could do this? What if we could do this? Um, but there's always been this threat and you got to mitigate threats is you can't invest with a threat you can't control. And the threat was Glassman. He didn't like the games and he was purposely not investing in the games. Well, if that's the case, why are we going to build up a huge youth development platform to send kids to a sport that is, has an imaginary ceiling on it, a glass ceiling. Now the growth potential is through the roof. Like the the things that Rose is talking about in parallels are, you know, these massive expanding sports like um, X games and MMA, UFC and, um, these incredibly exciting growth trajectories. Other thing about this, so with that, what that does is it provides a earning potential and professionalization for these athletes. But what people don't realize is even without that, if you want to become um, a gold medal wrestler from the United States, you dedicate your entire life, you pick your entire family or skier. Your entire family moves across the country to be with the best coaches and environment, academies, schools, quote unquote, that you could find to try to get that gold medal. When you're done with that gold medal, 
you have a gold medal, but really no financial security. It's not what people don't realize is people are trying to figure out like, how does this like what people don't realize is people are not chasing the six, seven figure incomes with these sports. They're not trying to become gold medalists in their sports because of the earning potential when they come home. That's reserved for less than a dozen people. And you can, like, you can name them. It's like the people have done this before. It's like Michael Johnson, Usain Bolt and track. Try and name another. Like Carl Lewis. Okay, if you're old. Got, like, got it. Um, swimming. Like you got like Michael Phelps. Try and name another. Like, you know, like man, it'd be like Janet Evans. You know, like there's, it's hard. Try like skiing. Okay, maybe Bodie Miller, maybe Lindsey. Vol- Actually, not maybe mm-hmm. those guys. Like they're kind of set. Outside of that, the other fifty thousand people that are doing this are just doing it for try to, for the trying to maximize their yeah. potential. And families are willing to do all of that just to get the gold medal. Now, what's cool is there's that, but there's also more earning potential in our sport than all those sports I just listed. If you are a top 30 in the world in our sport, you have greater earning potential than any of those sports. I believe it's something in the UFC like the 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 people that the title fights, like the people that like the the main fights of the night besides like for the um uh for the belt. So besides like if you are the number 1, but there's these title fights otherwise. Um if you're on the main card, I believe those guys get like 10 to 20 grand mm-hmm. a fight. They fight maybe five, six, seven times a year. So that's like, you know, you make it between like 50 and 120K as the best in the sport. Everyone else, that's why everyone else has, everybody has other jobs just like they do in our sport. But I believe two, three years down the road, when we come out of this COVID thing. And the open goes from its 300,000 participants to its two to three million participants, which it will go to. And it's going to, it's already the biggest participatory event in the world. And it just exceeds and explodes past that. Um, Things like the Academy will be a nice asset to, to have. I have so many questions. Um, Huh? (laughs) We haven't even talked about the difference of the season. Yeah, what that we, does. Let's, like, like yeah. there's. We'll, we'll we'll try to get it. We'll try to get as much of it as we can today, even maybe a little bit longer. Um, okay, so I think my first question is: you hinted at it a little bit in the sense that you've thought about this for a while. I wonder though, when if you could kind of bring us back to the moment when you realized that now was actually the time. And maybe it, it's happening faster than you anticipated, but like, can you bring us back to the the moment, the meeting, the conversation when you realized? Oh, this isn't a someday idea anymore. It's a today. What do we need to start doing today to start making this thing happen? Yeah, it was a uh, hmm. um So, we're having this conversation now at the end of February. Um I think it was probably about a year ago. So, a, a year ago, um I had I I put this all on paper with the different levels of the, you know, the elites and the dev team and the youth academy, um, what we look for for recruiting purposes, who we give scholarships to, um, what the programming would look like on a on a yearly, a seasonal, a monthly, a weekly, and a daily place, what we need from a coaching staff. So it kind of built out all the, um, the X's and O's to it. But I wasn't able to execute on any of it because I didn't have the yeah. bandwidth. Um, we hired a CEO for CompTrain um, named Pete. And when Pete came on board, it allowed us to execute on a lot more. Um, so we didn't have the financial wherewithal to be able to do something like this. Um, I have no interest or history or success on how to fund something like this. Um, Pete does. So we've been able to work with partners in the space to be able to, to, to fund the Academy. Um, so it's, um, it's self-sufficient. So we can do this thing, uh, which has been phenomenal. So that was, that was the trigger point was when I had the conversation with Pete and he goes, because to me it was like um, the blue sky thing. Like, hey, and down the road someday we could do this. And like, you know, it's one of these like, I love to have just those really exciting talks. And it was an exciting talk to share. Like to me just trying to download my brain. And he's like, let's go, let's do it. 
And it was kind of like, yeah, I know. Let's do it. He's like, no, like let, now let's do it today. Like let's get the athletes here and let's go. And I was like, I was like, you are such the right person for this. <laughs> like, yes. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. Um, okay. So that was, it. it was, yeah, it was probably about, uh, so I put it all on paper about a year ago. It's been in my brain for probably three years. Uh, and then maybe, uh, right when P came on, when I was downloading my brain to him. And, uh, I'm really curious it, you're, you've definitely talked a little bit about it already, but, um, but, uh, but I kind of want to ask directly, which is why does this make sense for comp train as a business? Like what, like so far we've talked a lot about, you know, the sexy yeah. parts of CrossFit and the CrossFit games, right? Catherine, the games, uh, all these, all these amazing athletes How, that, that can only make sense if it eventually flows back to comp train growing, comp train, continue to be successful, et cetera. Can you connect for us a little bit? The, those two things, like the, the, the professionalization of the sport and why it matter, why that is going to help comp train continue to grow, continue to evolve. Yeah, so uh, let's pull it back a little bit. So what is CompTrain? CompTrain is a platform to help people be kick-ass human beings. Like that's, like we want people to be amazing, like awesome, like not just, we're, we're the freaks. We're the freaks among the freaks. Like CrossFitters are already the freaks. Like, like shut up, I know you do CrossFit. Okay, I get it, you can do 20 pull-ups, cool. CompTrain's for the freaks amongst the freaks, right? It's for the people that um, haven't found a passion, they're obsessed. Like this is the, our crowd are the people that, um, you know, during every break, they're watching the YouTube videos about, you know, Froning and Fraser and Kat and Tia, and they're the ones obsessing about the leaderboard. And they're the ones that are, um, weighing and measuring their food and all of this stuff. It's like, they're looking to be awesome. Now it doesn't mean they're going to the games, nothing like that whatsoever. It doesn't even mean that they necessarily sign for a competition. It means that they are they just live and breathe this ethos of like fitness matters that much to me. And they want to do more than just the class. Like all of our people just do a class and then they're looking to do extra stuff. So give me – what should I be doing for my Olympic lifting? What should I be doing for my gymnastics progression? What should I be doing for extra conditioning work? And it lays it out for people in that format. So we're trying to create kick-ass humans. So – in order to do that, what we have to do is show that we create kick-ass mm. humans. <laughs> like we have to show that we can do the tip of the spear. Like if without that, it's like, what, what, where's the proof in the pudding? Where's the credence? Where's the, you got to put a notch in a belt. And that's why that matters to us. So we operate on a flywheel. So flywheels were popularized by Jim Collins and good to great. And he actually ended up writing in a separate like ebook for Harvard business review, I think call, uh, on the flywheel. And the idea of a flywheel is like, if you do this, then this happens. And if you do that, then this happens. And if you do that, then this happens. And it spins the whole thing up and creates momentum for your business. So our flywheel starts with getting world-class athletes, world-class results on a world-class stage. That means, you know, Kat being on the podium, Sam being on the podium. It means these guys finishing and contending for the being the best in the world. When we can do that, then we're showing that our program works and it creates this aspirational aspect, which is the next part of the flywheel. So imagine like literally like the kind of like the, the circle going around, the wheel going around. It starts with world-class athletes on a world-class stage. If we do that, then we can inspire everyday athletes. We can get people to say like, I can do that. I can be like Kat. I can um, work on my body. I can work on my performance. I can work on my mindset. I can become a better version of myself. We can inspire people to do it, to jump in the arena, out of the stands, and be one of the, the one of the, the contenders. If we inspire everyday athletes, athletes to take action, then the next part of the flywheel is to deliver a great customer experience and great results to them. So they thoroughly enjoy this process of becoming better and they actually do become better. The results are twofold. If we do that, we can then fuel an economic engine. We can create some earnings, some potential, we will charge for our programming. And that will then in turn allow us to 
create more results at a world-class stage and inspire more people, inspire them better, get them even better results by investing even more into the platform, by giving them more personalized stuff, which is all coming down the pipeline. I'm so excited to talk about all this stuff. It's, you know, as a, in the app world, which I didn't realize is I, I'm working with six to 12 months out for what's happening right now. So all this cool personalization, like the program is going to be for you, Patrick. It's going to be like your strengths, your weaknesses, your goals, your ability. How much time do you have to work out today? Like that's all that we can do now because we are, you can't do that if you're going off of um, the CrossFit New England model, the affiliate model, the, the, there isn't enough earnings mm-hmm. there. So um, it allows us to kind of create what we want to create. So that's why the performance at the elite level fits into the the entirety of comp train and why that matters. Can you talk a little bit about the current landscape of, I don't know what to call it other than competitive programming. It's certainly not, you know, when we, when you and I started CrossFit, you know, nobody, nobody was doing this, but now it's, you know, I could list off the top of my head, five to six brands, companies, people aiming to do this kind of idea, right? Come with us. Yeah. Our program will help you get to the games. Our program will help you perform it to your to your to your utmost potential. How much of that is motivating you to continue to push and push and push towards something that other people aren't doing or can't do? Right? Because when you line them up, if if all if if everybody says we can get you to the games, and suddenly it's like, well, I don't know who to pick. I don't know what yeah. to choose. And what ultimately right. it comes down to is, well, which games athlete do I like? And I guess maybe I'll follow that. Huh. So can you talk to me about like right. maybe just the the evolution of that landscape, that business, that business model to a degree, and how much of that is spurring you on, knowing that well, we can't do the same thing everybody else is doing because then what well, you know, there's no way for us to do to do anything more. Right. So it's, uh, it comes down to like the reason that so many are popping up and there are so many compared to when we started this thing in 2012, um, which there's very, very few people doing competitive programming is the barrier to entry. There's just zero barrier to entry now more so than ever. And the second part of it is the business model itself in the SaaS business model, the subscription as a service model is incredibly profitable. It's incredibly scalable. So it's such an an enticing market. It's easy to enter and it's easy to make a profit. So because of that, everyone's going to come out of the woodwork to be able to do this. And without that, you're nailing it on the head. Without the core differentiators, how do you decipher as a um, one brand from the next? So absolutely, this is more important to us now than it was in 2012. Mm -hmm. In 2012, it was us or comp train itself. Like there was nobody else doing this. Um, OPT probably. Mm -hmm. It was like the two of us. Um, um, And now with more players in the field, it it matters because anybody can enter the market. You have a website. Literally a website gets you there. Now we've developed an app and an app makes it another higher level of barrier, right? Because now you need a couple hundred thousand dollars to build an app. But there's a reason that there's, we, we've had sneakers forever. Like I shouldn't say forever. Sneakers actually have been only around the way that they work now. Um, you know, athletic shoes, kind of since Nike popularized them in the 70s. But even that, 50 years, 50 years of sneakers, incredibly profitable business. Why do we only have like five major yeah. players? Because the barrier energy is so high. You got to like manufacture from China and create like these product designs and the fits and inventories. And all. We don't have that. It's just like put something on a website, get 10 people to sign up and you're profitable. Yeah. Like the, the phrase I love that I think fits nicely with this idea is um, building a moat around your business, right? A moat in the sense yeah. of... Uh, you got it's a big leap to get over it right and i think what i'm hearing from you is you're starting to build the moat right and maybe it's the academy maybe it's the app maybe it's some it's probably some amalgamation of all of it um but it's going to be suddenly a lot harder to play at this level because now now you've got now you've got this moat right. there right um i i'm really curious about why why you <laughs> it's a funny question but why you like why of all of the people in this space playing this game why are you, why are you, why have you been the one to be able to pull this particular thing off when everybody's got big ambitions, but everybody seems to be stuck on, 
well, I'm going to offer a different training program. I'm going to do a weightlifting thing and that'll be, you know, whatever it might be, right? There's like small iterations. Yeah. What about you? Can you, can you, if you can articulate it, uh, has allowed you to first have the vision and then also be able to surround yourself with the right people who can then help you execute it. Do you have a sense of that? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I, I honestly yeah. don't know. I, I've been lucky enough to have really awesome people around me. You know, Harry from day one helped develop CompTrain. Um, Pete um, has been able to take CompTrain to the next level. Um, so, you know, it's one of those like everyone has ideas, but it's only the ability to execute on ideas is actually what matters. Like you put all your thoughts, wishes, hopes, and dreams on one side of a scale and a pile of crap on the other. The pile of crap weighs more. It's more valuable than all the, like, it's just, it's about what you actually have. It's what you're actually creating. So I guess if it's, the, there's an answer to it, it's that I've been lucky enough to be surrounded by people that can do stuff because <laughs> I can't do stuff. I can just think about, I think about stuff and I um, think about these ideas. And um, when these ideas get put in the hands of the right people, things can happen. So I guess it's the, it's the luck of it. It's the luck of being um, with the right people. You know, to get back to like I, I your your moat analogy. I'm just gonna I'm gonna jump back yeah. to the previous point a little bit because it got me excited a little bit about it. Is um, I like the idea of the moat, and it's not so much for me about um, protecting what we have or keeping other people away. It's not about. It's not even about beating the competition. Mm -hmm. It's about developing the best product for the end user. Like there is a customer out there that wants to be able to get from five to 10 unbroken handstand pushups. There's somebody out there that's busting their ass working so, so hard and not seeing the results. There's other people that just don't know how to line up a program. There's other people that would do anything to be in the top 20 of the open. They're trying to like make it to the games. Like these people that we have, like Sam, Amanda, like these, these people just started following our programming. They, we didn't seek them out. They didn't like call us up and like, they just followed, started following the programming and they're making it to the games. Like that's so cool. Now, if there's better things that we can deliver to them and oh my gosh, there is, can we bring the way that we work with Katrin in person to a digital platform? And we're doing that. Like I'm proud to say that we're getting every single month, we're adding something on the platform that gets us closer and closer and closer to that right up into like what we're going to be doing for affiliates. And we used to do an immersion program that you had a huge part in yep. creating, you know, you created all of the content for it and had a massive part in our immersion program. We'd bring affiliate owners here by the, by the half dozen to a dozen and bring them through two or three days of immersive behind the scenes, um, business, how it works. We're going to give that all away for basically for free. It's like anybody that signs up for our programming is going to get all of that now through a digital cool. platform. It's all coming out from how to market to people, to how to hire your coaches, to how to review for your coaches, to how to um, change the customer experience from where your churn is most likely somewhere in that um, you know 45 day mark for most affiliates. Can you extend that out to more like eight, nine? 12 months or two years like that. We have a, pro we have a process that we use to extend the life, um, the, you know, the average client lifetime value to, um, to how to create better branding and, you know, how to, um, um use social media. Um, so bring all of that. So really it's, it's as much as it seems like it's a moat and it's a, let's create differentiation and let's, um, let's, uh, uh, creates this um, brand identity through doing something better. Yeah, but that's kind of the symptom. Mm -hmm. That's the side effect of just doing things better, right? That's all we're doing is like, just keep trying to make it better. I think that, you know, I had a, a guy in town um, last week, um, professional hockey player of 12 years, really, you know, really high level hockey player. Um, and he asked, he's like, what, um, um, his question was somewhere along the lines. He's like, don't be humble. 
why is CFNE Comp Train where it is where um, maybe some other business owners haven't gotten there? And my only answer was like intentionality. Like we're trying to, like we're trying, like we're trying to get, like we know what two years is going to look like and then we just try to get to two years. So it's like, kind of like if you want to be a games athlete, you know what you're supposed to be clean and jerking, how fast you're supposed to run a mile and how many muscle-ups you need to do. So it's like, just spend two years to get there. And then you get there and you go, okay, now what's the next thing? So maybe it's, that's what was my roundabout way of coming back to. Maybe it's two things. It's the luck of being around the right people. And then the intentionality of going there, not the reactivity of today. Not like I got to pay my bills. I got to cover classes for the coach that called in sick. Um, the toilet's broken. Like you got to do all those things, but you can't be so focused on the urgent in the immediate that you forget to develop the importance. You said something earlier that I don't want to, I don't want to pass over, which is this idea that at some point you're confident that the, the open, and this is just a representation of, of obviously a lot of things, but the open will see not 300,000 participants, but 2 million or 3 million. Can you, can you unpack that a little bit? And maybe it's, the Eric Rosa, you know, sure. bringing that back into the conversation, but just like yep. that, that number surprises me and it, uh, and I don't know if it should. Yeah. So uh, it's 10 X growth. So if, if there's been as high as 400 and uh, like, I think it's been 400,000 was, was the highest open participation ever. Um, then last year hits um, where they basically, uh, you know, didn't pay attention. They basically took away all the open announcements, like for the first time ever. People, that was only last year. Um, so the open just doesn't seem to matter anymore. Um, only from the open, the next step from the open is we're going to take the top 20 guys and girls or 30 guys and girls and they go to the games. And it's like, what about the other, you know, um, 300,900, 300, like the, the other crazy huge number of people, what happens to them? And what Eric and I'm guessing Dave had an um, insight in as well is God, is this so brilliant in its simplicity? It makes so much sense. Like let's have a participatory event, the open, where you could have millions of people participating. Then from there, let's take the top 10%. That's such a beautiful number. Because it's still elite. You're in the 90th percentile. Like when you used to take standardized tests, if you were in the 90th percentile, like mom and dad bragged about you to their neighbors. Like that's what happened. So amazing. If you're in the 81st percentile, probably not, right? But the 90th and above, cool. You are now, you've earned something. But that's still a massive number now. If there's 400,000 people that compete in the open, that's 40,000 people that move on to the next stage. Whereas last year, that was 4D. 40, like 4-0. So they went from 40 people to 40,000 people that are now going to identify themselves as competitive CrossFit athletes. So right there, all we're looking for is 10X, remember. That's all we wanted. We just went up 1,000X. That was 1,000 percent growth in people that self-identify themselves as CrossFit athletes. I think people are going to be surprised this year when all of a sudden the Open's over and they're going to go, congratulations, you qualified for the quarterfinals. People are going to go like, what? (laughs) I'm what? Like I've never been in the top 10,000. Right. You don't need to be in the top 10,000 to qualify for this thing. You are now advancing to the next stage. And then what people are going to do is go like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize. Like I finished in... 63, you know, 63,000th. But if I had just lifted five more pounds and done two more reps and gotten one more second faster, I would have made it. And the next year, they're all going to go. And the diehards are going to, it's going to happen from the nucleus. It's the diehards. There's going to be that growth. And with that growth, it's going to happen. It's going to pulse and pulse and pulse. It's going to ripple effect out to the extremities, which is the 3 million. Mm-hmm. Cool part about this is um, other way that we can help do our product better is in the past, we like everybody. So currently we have an open program and a games mm-hmm. program. We used to have an open program and a regionals program, and we never had a great games program. 
because it didn't make sense because there's only 40 people going in the world. Like, why would you make a pro? Well, regionals went away and all these sanctioned events popped up. We're not going to call it sanctioned <laughs> pro track. So we did opening games. Well, now there's a whole bunch of stuff. By the way, um, as much growth as that happened, now 25%, one in four teams are going to make it. What that means is one in four people, one in four people could be going to the games. I'm going to start going to the quarterfinals. One in four. So think of how many people are going to be like interested in our sport now. So what we're going to do, which I'm super excited about, comp train, when I say we, is um, I think we're going to do what no one else is doing, which is essentially kind of what started comp train in the beginning, which was there was this little group called, comp, called Masters Athletes. And no one was kind of like taking care of the masters athletes. They were kind of left out on an island by themselves. And what we did was like, we got you. We know that there's this thing called the age group online qualifier, which the top 200 athletes qualify for. We're going to program specifically for that event. We'll taper so you are able to peak for that event. When workouts are announced for it, we'll specifically put them into our training week. So we can practice slash train for them appropriately. And then we'll help you navigate that weekend because it's four or five events across three days. So you have to double up on some days. You're going to repeat some workouts. You're not going to repeat others. We, and over the years, we've, I'm not going to say we've figured it out, but we've learned from our mistakes and we've done this for half a decade where we've, we know how to train for that type of format. It's honestly what led us really well to when we did the stage one of the games. Stage one of the games was that. Here's five, six, seven workouts across three days to, you know, whatever it was um, at home. In your, and we figured out how to do it because we knew how to do that well. So that's why we were able to send 30% of the field to the games. And that's pretty much on par with what we've done, luckily, you know, with the other um, – um, into you know, groups like our age group online qualifier, we send about 30% of the field comes from comp train athletes and, um, you know, 30% of the podium is comp train athletes, which is, it's somewhere between 20 and I'll call it 25%. We have 30% at the games and it's usually 25% otherwise. Um, and then what you have is now you have these three different groups. You have age groupers, you have teams again, and by the way, teams is competitive, no more super teams. And individuals. So you have all of those three different avenues, pillars, and then you have open, quarterfinals, semifinals, games. We are, and actually semifinals has a whole bunch of different semifinals all over the world. What we are going to do, it's again, kind of the, the um, we're lucky enough that we have a team able to do this, is we're going to program for all of it. Meaning, if you're one of our, athletes just by signing up um we're going to program the open for you we're going to program the age group online qualifier for you if you make it through that and you make it to a semifinal tell us what semifinal you're going to and we're going to program it specifically for that one for you meaning um let's say it's um um the west coast classic well the west coast classic is going to have a certain number of days it's going to start on a different day than other ones will it's going to have set unique events that we'll program for that are unique to that. And then we'll create a taper and a peak and be able to work in all the announced events when they announce them into your training. So essentially what we want to do is be like, hey, regardless of who you are, where you are, we got you, bro. Like, I want to be your spirit guy. You're the hero. You're doing the work. We're not doing, you know, we're not lifting a barbell. You, you deserve all of the credit. We just want to be here to help you along the way. All right. Um, that's actually a really good segue. I, I wasn't planning to do this, but I think we're going to do a two-parter on this Comptron Academy because there's a lot that I have, a lot of questions that I have that we haven't got to. Um, and we're running up against the, the, the clock here a bit. So we're going to be back next week with a part two on this conversation about the Comp Train Academy. Until then, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for your ratings and your reviews. And do make sure you check us out next week when we continue this conversation. You can get every episode of Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Until next time, thank you for listening.